Hey guys, in this week's episode, we're going to review It Chapter 2, but before that, we're going to talk about Joker at the Venice Film Festival, It Comes at Night, and the Pierre Etax Criterion box set. Join us. Welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always to battle our childhood demons is Mike. How are you doing today, sir? Good. Has it been 27 years already? It has already been 27 years. Also with me to battle our childhood demons is Justin. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. It doesn't really come across in podcast form, but I am doing the Pennywise dance. (laughs) Oh, creepy. (laughs) Yeah, maybe we're battling Justin well, I'm doing it uh, to make fun of him, so, oh, okay, so I'm with okay. you guys. Uh, ironically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense now. If this is your first time listening to the show, normally we like to start off every episode in a section called News on the March, and then for our feature review, today we're going to be reviewing It Chapter 2. Woo! I know, I know. Try to contain your excitement, please. We have a show to record. Sorry. Uh- does that mean I have to stop dancing? Uh, well, I mean, as long as it... Yes, it does. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm done then. Um, okay, so guys, this week, since we're watching It Chapter 2 and reviewing it, I had a question that I thought would be appropriate. What is your least favorite clown? Least favorite clown? Oh my gosh. Yep. Of all the clowns that you've ever seen, famous or otherwise... What's your least favorite? Go ahead, Chris. I need a minute, need a minute on this one. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. Um, oh, my. I'll give you mine, since you guys both need a moment to uh, process this. Okay, so when I was very little, growing up in the 90s, The Simpsons was on. Mm-hmm. And Bart had a nemesis. There was a side, uh, sideshow clown. Do you guys remember this character? Sideshow Bob. Sideshow Bob. Yeah, Sideshow Bob. And for a long time, he was plotting to kill Bart. Do you remember that? I do. Mm -hmm. How could I forget? When I was a little kid, for some reason, uh, I don't know, I'm embarrassed to say this, that scared me. For some reason, the idea of that creeped me out. Like the idea of a disgruntled, like, um, man who, for some reason, chose his profession to be a clown. (laughs) <laughs> being miserable and wanting to kill a child, you know, like didn't seem so humorous to me whenever I was a little kid. So that's the one that left the biggest impression on me, I think, was uh, Sideshow Bob. That's fair enough. Yeah. Did I give you guys adequate time to come up with your clowns? I don't know. What What do you think, Justin? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'll go. I don't, don't really have a ton of experience with clowns, so I don't have a whole lot to choose from. I didn't either, but, you know, I had to pick something on brand for the episode, you know? I don't know. <laughs> so the one that I guess would have scared me in that sense, and that, that being my least favorite, is also in an older show from the 90s when I was growing up, but uh, do you guys remember Are You Afraid of the Dark? Mm-hmm. I do. Yeah, so there was an episode where kids went to like a carnival fair thing and they stole the clown's nose. <laughs> and then the clown like came after him. And yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. And so that scared me as a kid. So that one I'm not a fan of. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Chris, what, what say you? Um, Yeah, I'm kind of in the same camp as Justin. There's not a lot of... Uh, I, I've had plenty of scary moments as a kid, like things I was scared of that I sh- that weren't necessarily... You don't have to be scared of it. I'm just saying, what's your least favorite? Of all movies, all TV shows, every trip to McDonald's, what clown rubbed you the wrong way, whether it be fear or annoyance? Surely, if you're not scared of them, you at least don't like them, right? Like, I don't know anyone who liked clowns. I don't really have one right off the top of my head, um, and I've been thinking about it. I, like, there are... So he's saying you like clowns. I actually kind of do. That's the, the nice creepiest ones. thing yeah. you could have said. <laughs> what about John Wayne Gacy? He was kind of, He's coming up on a clown. He would like perform. What about his... Sweet Tooth from Twisted Metal? <laughs> That's one, but I like his car. Like I like playing as him a lot. But his head is on fire. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's scary. But John Wayne Gacy dressed up as clowns for like children's parties and stuff. And then he was a serial killer. So he's pretty unlikable. 
From, you know, from the sounds of it, it sounds like Chris likes that. <laughs> uh, well, I, mean, I wouldn't say like that's the aberration. You know, clowns have always, you know, made me little uh, balloon animals. Like, uh, there's nothing wrong with balloon animals. Oh, gross. You do like clowns. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. We found out too much about Chris today. <laughs> Other than bashing clowns, here on the Casual Cinecast, every other week we put out a Casually Criterion episode uh, that you, the voters, get to vote on. In these episodes, the listeners get to choose a film from the Criterion Collection for us to review by voting on in social media. Go check out our last episode on The Valley of the Dolls, and to announce our next week's episode is Mike. All right, so the winner of the last poll for the next Casually Criterion episode with... 42% 42% was Barry Lyndon, which was my choice. Yay. Nice way to go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Coming in at number two with, well, I guess the next two are tied. Yeah. Yeah. So both with 29% are Solaris and Last Temptation of Christ. The theme that united all of these was adaptations. Yeah. So if you voted, thanks for voting. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, especially because I won. I get to watch Barry <laughs> Lyndon for the first time and talk about it on the show, which is exciting. Nice. It'll be my second time. We watched it way back when we first started the podcast. We guessed it on Criterion Now, and the movie we reviewed on the episode was Barry Lyndon. So Chris and I both watched it then. So Yeah, we were very green back then. Yeah, so you guys are like Barry Lyndon experts. Pretty much. Essentially. Oh, man, that's intimidating <laughs> for me to <laughs> review it with you guys. Yeah. Well, if you want to vote in our next Criterion poll or send us any questions for us to answer about Barry Lyndon or topics to discuss about Barry Lyndon, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. You can send your questions or topics to casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't yet and you like the show, go on to iTunes, give us a five-star review, let us know what you think of the show. It'll help other people find the show so that we can have more people listening and more people voting. And... If I understand democracy correctly, the more people that vote, the better representation of what the people want will happen in our criterion polls. We actually just set up an electoral college, so representation isn't really all it's made up to be. Yeah, your vote doesn't matter. Wow. Hey, man, hard truths. Dark. Just kidding. Dark. There's no such thing. This is pure democracy. (laughs) Vote away. The will of the people have spoken, and it's Barry Lyndon at 42%. Awesome. Yep. And with that, gentlemen, are we ready to go ahead and move into News on the March? Yes. News on the March! All right, guys. So recently this last week was the Venice Film Festival. Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix's Joker premiered there. Mm -hmm. And would you believe it or not, it won the Gold Lion and got a standing ovation. Yeah, I want to guys ask you guys a question. We started talking about Joker and Joaquin Phoenix like was circling that the project, uh, you know, about, I don't know, like almost a year ago, if not more. And when we first talked about it, I don't think any of us. I was probably the most excited about it, but I don't think you guys were super excited about it. Like, and I would have never guessed that this movie was going to like do, you know, like win something like the Golden Lion, right? It's pretty crazy, right? Yeah, it is. I I don't think you're alone in being surprised that it would go on to do this sort of thing. And you're right that back then I didn't really care. And I think any talk of a Joker movie coming after things like Suicide Squad and Justice League I think it's right. I think it's fair that we weren't excited about a Joker film. Mm-hmm. No. But I think having seen the trailer, like the teaser trailer that came out and I just saw the full-length trailer, having seen those, I was much more excited about it and and I can see how this might actually be good enough to win a film festival. Like it makes sense seeing this news alongside the trailer. Well, I mean, it looks like an actor's movie, right? I mean, it doesn't look like there's any kind of agenda here it this movie seems to me of desperation right like warner brothers has tried everything they can with this dc franchise and just recently have they started getting on like a roll of things that seem to be working for people with like aquaman 
and and now this. Yeah, but this is so much different than anything. Well, that, I agree, right? Yeah. But but this seems to me like something that like four years ago would have been unheard of. This kind of movie coming out, like I think it's an R-rated movie that's not directly tied to anything about a character that's not really proven to carry his own movie, mm-hmm. starring uh, an actor that's not like he's talented and everyone agrees is talented, but is not particularly likable or doesn't necessarily care to try to be likable, you know? Right. He doesn't play the movie star role. Right. He doesn't care about that. He's like, he's just an artist. Right. And all of those things combining, like, I don't know, you know, before Justice League, I would have said this is impossible. Mm hmm. But uh, I don't know. You know, it looks good. It looks like it's drawing from some really interesting movies like um, King of Comedy, a Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro movie from the 80s. Mm hmm. I can't help but think about that whenever Robert De Niro seems to be playing the Jerry Lewis role from that movie in this movie. Right. Right. Uh, It's just interesting. I feel like in this day and age when we hear about on the news so often like mass murder, you know, um, all kinds of terrible tragedies every week that have been going on steadily for, you know, what, almost 20 years now or more. It seems interesting to me that this movie is just now coming out and it could have a lot to say about that kind of culture and that kind of i don't know you know darkness hidden darkness within our society it it also could be um just another popcorn comic book flick but based on the golden lion uh and the standing ovation it could be something within this franchise of otherwise pretty hollow movies you know what i mean like entertaining sure but n- these superhero movies haven't been saying a whole lot you know Yeah, it seems like it could be sort of genre bending or genre defying in a sense. Yeah, they have they have a real chance to actually say something here. Right. And I think what does it for me in the trailers is that so much of the drama or tension and draw of the trailer is the character of the Joker. And it seems to be based on that. It doesn't I don't necessarily get vibes of there's going to be a big action set piece at some point. And I would be surprised if some sort of big villain shows up to make a third act big climactic battle (laughs) i expect this movie to end in a mass murder of some sort the word from venice film festival and all the people that have seen this film uh there's definitely this controversy that's kind of swirling around this film uh because i i don't think it would be unsimilar to compare this controversy to the same thing that probably came out when taxi driver first came out Uh, i wasn't alive for that but I f- get the feeling that it's kind of the same. You yeah, know, like a heavy yeah. taxi driver vibes for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just Martin Scorsese in general, really. Yeah. Right. Which all leads to me being really excited about this film coming out now. Are you more or less excited about this than uh, Martin Scorsese's movie coming out, The Irishman? Ooh. Significantly more excited about Joker. Really? Yeah. Just because of the de-aging or just because you don't think The Irishman looks good? Well, it's not really the de-aging. That doesn't bother me. It's more that Robert De Niro and Al Pacino don't necessarily have a great track record from like the early 2000s on. Just yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Only in the last couple of decades, man. Yeah, that's Before it. Before that, though, they were on fire. And that's outside of Martin Scorsese as well. Yeah, that's... but Martin Scorsese hasn't had a bad track record in the past 20 years, though. Yeah. He hasn't. It's just, you know. it's. I, I hear you. I hear you. It taints the whole thing a little bit. Let's just like looking at their output. I get you. But Martin Scorsese's output gives me hope. I'm just worried about the de-aging technology looking a little wonky because it's like a three hour movie. Three and a half hour movie. Three and a half hour movie. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. it's as long as Lawrence of Arabia. Woo. It's long. Yeah. So anyone have anything else about the Joker or excuse me, Joker? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I can't wait to watch it so I can, like, everybody on Twitter and everybody, you know, like, all the press people have already seen it. I I just really want to be able to join in the conversation and, uh, you know, not feel left behind, (laughs) right? So I I can't wait to see it. Next month, right? I think, yeah, very soon, very soon, like a month away. Anyway, Chris, what comes at night? It does. Oh, tell me more. But not the Stephen King's it. Like you were talking about the Venice Film Festival is going on. And ju- I, actually, I think it just ended. But I believe TIFF 
is still going on as we record this. That's a Toronto International Film Festival. And one of the films that's made a big splash there is called Waves, which is directed... <laughs> was that a pun? Was it? Waves making a big splash? Maybe. I'll never admit anything to you, sir. But uh, the director who made the big splash with the movie Waves is... His name is Trey Edward Schultz. But not the movie A Bigger Splash. <laughs> yeah, not the Tom Hanks, uh, um, Daryl Hannah movie about a mermaid. That's just splash. <laughs> Go on. I don't know where we are. All right. But yeah, Trey Edward Schultz uh, directed this film, and there was a movie of his that I've been wanting to watch for a while. It is called It Comes at Night, and I watched it this weekend. Yeah, with Joel Egerton, right? Joel Egerton. And the uh, poor man's Kit Harrington, whose name I can't remember. Christopher Abbott? Maybe. Does he look like Kit Harrington? Uh, not until you just said that, but now I can't unsee it, so yep, thanks for that. that's him. Yeah. Um, it also has Riley Ko in it and uh, Carmen Ijogo. Ooh, uh, from from uh, Mad Max Fury Road, right? Riley Ko? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's in a bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah. Okay. She's kind of up and coming. I think uh, I'm, I like her a lot. But then uh, also Kelvin Harrison Jr. has been kind of making some waves. He's in a movie called Loose that uh, people have been talking about lately. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm interested in it, and I think he's kind of a, a up-and-comer as well. He's also in Waves that uh, Trey Edward Schultz made. But I went back and watched It Comes at Night, and man, this movie is such a feel-good movie. Uh, no, it, it's not at all. It is tense and suspenseful. Um, it is about a family that is living in a post-apocalyptic world which they never really explain the post-apocalypse part of it which i find refreshing you know because they don't spend a lot of time in exposition yeah. telling you what's happened to the world it's just that the world something has happened mm-hmm. um and this family runs into another family and they start living together communally and tensions arise and man this movie is uh really really great it was really well made. The The camera moves in such a way with these long takes that just ramp up the suspense. I had to watch... <laughs> uh, I actually watched the greatest... What is it? The greatest baking? The great B- British bake-off that Justin watches all the time. I had to watch that afterwards to kind of relax after having watched this movie because <laughs> it was so suspenseful and so... <laughs> like just... Uh, dour uh, too so I wouldn't necessarily recommend this if you had a bad day but this is just a really well made well crafted film the, all the performances are great I, I also like you know what the characters know and so in that way you're just like the characters so they're not feeding you information or there there are maybe some loose thread you know plot threads that are hanging there but you don't necessarily need to know it to appreciate the film because you're supposed to be just like the characters, right? Yeah, uh, it's just a really great film. Um, Mike, you've seen it before, right? What do you think? Yeah, I actually saw this in theaters back when it oh, came nice. out. Yeah, and I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. I think the audience I was with and the common complaint I've heard about it is that like general audiences did not like it at all. And I think that's because it was marketed as a horror movie called It Comes at Night. So I think everyone in the audience was expecting something to come. <laughs> at night a physical being to come right and i yeah. think audiences um felt kind of re- betrayed i guess by the marketing which i understand but me not necessarily caring about that kind of thing i really enjoyed it this is like the best movie i've seen joel egerton in yeah i haven't seen him in a ton of stuff but yeah me neither i've seen him in a lot of stuff but this is i think the movie where he Stands out really, really great. And another movie that uh, that he was in with Tom Hardy and Nick Nolte called Warrior. I haven't seen it. I, I think the UFC aspect of that kind of turned me off. But I've only I've only heard good things about it. Yeah, yeah. It's so much better than just like a fighting movie, right? It's like um, like Rocky or something like, like that. It's like Creed, yeah. Right? Like it's like yeah, it's about fighting, but it, it's really about character, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly. If you go into this film expecting typical story satisfaction you know like yeah. closure and stuff like that you're not gonna get it 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 is a horror movie to me uh because i'm 
the whole movie is just filled with dread, like, to me. Well, dread, yes, but yeah. not necessarily scares. Yeah, there's, yeah, and there's not necessarily a lot of gore or violence that's happening in it. Right. But the dread, the horror of the dread and what's ha- coming, you know, is, yeah, I, that makes it a horror movie to me. But that's a maybe a loose definition of horror, but, yeah. Right. So let me ask you a question, because I believe both of you guys have seen The Witch, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this movie I remember coming out, did it come out around the same time as The Witch? The same year, yeah. Yeah. I was recommended this movie and The Witch at some point during that year, and I watched The Witch, which I thought was okay, Mm -hmm. Uh, and that kind of kept me from watching It Comes at Night. So for anybody who maybe like didn't like The Witch or me, um, not just, I don't want to say I didn't like it, but like, are the two really similar? Because I got similar vibes based on the trailer. I don't think they're very similar. I don't think they're very similar, but I, they're both about equally as scary. Sure. So if you're going in looking for traditional horror movies, if if you didn't like The Witch, you will not like It Comes at Night. Right. It's just as concerned with scaring you as The Witch was. There's much more dread in It Comes at Night. At least that's what I felt. It's been a while since I've watched uh, The Witch. I like The Witch better. Do you? Yeah, I like The Witch. Trim- like I like infinitely better than it I like it, it comes at night quite a bit but i thought the witch was really good so i'm on the opposite yeah. end of justin from that i think in my opinion i can't imagine what i would want out of a horror movie more than the witch yeah well i, I think to, to me both the movies are kind of on the same level and um yeah like, i agreed with that especially at the expectations of what comes next for these directors like the witch uh the lighthouse from yeah I, yeah i want to see the lighthouse really bad the lighthouse looks great i just saw the trailer for that when i went to see it yeah, it looks pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I have not seen the trailer. I, I don't think I'm going to watch the trailer for The Lighthouse um, because I, I, I'm already sold on it. So I'll go watch it. But yeah, so both of those movies I'm looking forward to. And, you know, like there was another director that came out around that same time. Like uh, It Follows, I think. And we've gotten his follow up to that, too. I don't know if It Follows came out that same year, but there's a lot of A24 directors that have come out. I'm looking forward to seeing what they do next. Cool. Yeah, agreed. I think the one lesson that we can all pull away from this is that there's very few bad days that Great British Baking Show can't help soothe. Can't fix. Yeah, that was actually my first time watching it. It was. Oh, really? uh, yeah, it was so nice. Like, uh, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, because so it was a reality show, and you've talked about it. Um, and this is kind of a diversion. We didn't plan on talking about this, but just real quick, uh, what I really love about this is that. You know, they're all competing against each other, right? But they're not really competing against each other. They just all want to do their best. And they, and like, there's one character that wasn't doing very well. And so this other, this lady went and started helping him. You know, they're both contestants and, you know, she would be better off letting him just crash and burn, right? Yeah. But, you know, she goes and helps him and the hosts are really nice. Like, so there's, there's a Simon Cowell type. Uh, in here where he's like very critical of stuff but he does it in a so so nicely <laughs> you know it's yeah. it's so great like it's definitely one that you can watch and uh it, it'll help fix your your day yeah, it's like therapeutic <laughs> i swear <laughs> yeah yeah so a second plug on the show for great british baking show which i never expected to get i'm, I'm glad you watched it oh yeah me too yeah you'll never get me though <laughs> well you might Just you kidding. might have better days if you did though not saying you have bad ones, but you know. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I've just never been one for cooking shows, you know? Me neither. Yeah, well, there you go. That's a that's another vouch for the wonderful British baking show. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Justin, beyond just fanboying out about that show, <laughs> what else have you been doing this week? So, this week... I dove back into a box set that I purchased a long time ago from the Criterion Collection, and it is the box set of the director Pierre Etex, who's a French comedy filmmaker. And I watched these films forever ago when I was in grad film school and bought the box set and just kind of like fell in love with his work. It has been a long time since... I rewatched any of these. Like I, I've basically seen every film in it once. And so I went back to show my fiance, one of the films 
in this box set, which is called The Suitor, which is one of the feature-length films because this uh, box set also has some shorts that he made. Um, yeah. And watching it, I'm, I was just reminded of like the genius of this comedy filmmaker. And the, the reason that I want to talk about on the show is because like I think his stuff is pretty underseen and he's not often talked about. And I think part of the reason he was unseen is because his films were in such bad condition and not well kept like uh, other famous comedy filmmakers, such as like Jacques Tati, who he's very similar to. And actually he came out of making films and writing gags for Jacques Tati or, or, you know, obvious, more obvious ones like Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton. Like he's not as celebrated as these, but yeah, he wasn't able to have the career resurgence decades later that those guys were because his films weren't taken care of. Right, so Criterion, in their infinite goodness, took the, <laughs> took the films and uh, fixed a lot of them who, that were in really bad shape, along with Pierre Etax, uh, who helped supervise all of this and like recreate the really interesting, unique soundtracks that he has on the films too, and helped like restore those. But these films are like are really, really amazing. And like I said, I want to talk about them because I think this guy deserves more respect. Like to me, he deserves as much respect uh, as Chaplin and Keaton and Jacques Tati. And goodness, that says a lot. Right. But I think he's just, especially with Keaton. Cause I respect Keaton more than any of them. Just sure. from like the, um, constant like peril he was putting himself in. Yeah. I mean, I mean Keaton, does, he gets that respect f- for that, for like the stunt work. And, and this guy's not doing the stunt work like that, but like the, the cleverness yeah of his gags and the way that his gags are written and the sense of humor that they appeal to, I guess, because they're very dry at times. They're not somebody getting hit in the face or something or like something really obviously kind of like laugh out loud, funny and slapstick like Chaplin Mm -hmm. would be like the very, very subtle, much more like Jacques Tati. And anybody who's listening, who doesn't know who Jacques Tati is, he's, uh, another uh, French comedy filmmaker. They're both kind of mostly, they play mostly silent characters. So there's not Jacques Tati was like uh, Mr. Bean before Mr. Bean existed. Exactly. Yeah. And so he's got a great film. If you've never seen it, it's one of my favorite films called Monsieur Hulot's holiday. Uh, So look, you do love that movie. I do. (laughs) That's the Jacques Tati film to, to check out. But uh, Pierre Etax, man, uh, he's also got two amazing short films on here called rupture and happy anniversary and happy anniversary actually won the Academy award for best short film, best live action short film one year and whatever year it came out the early sixties, like 1961. I think I don't know if they're still on YouTube, but I first saw these shorts on YouTube, which is what convinced me to buy the box set. So I highly recommend looking up Pierre E taxes, rupture and happy anniversary shorts they're both like 10 minutes long and checking them out and like if you like those check out the rest of this box set because the guy's super funny and i think he gets a little bit more artistic in his later films like one of his films pretty much reminded me of a of a cross of jacques tati and fellini which is a really interesting combination (laughs) yeah interesting so anyways i think you guys chris and mike i think you would both very much appreciate his films and anybody who just likes comedy, who likes Buster Keaton or Chaplin or Tati. Yeah. Or even if you hate comedy, but you want to expand your cinematic horizons. <laughs> right. <laughs> we need to figure out a way to get this in our uh, polls. I think I know it's, it's I'm waiting for like the opportunity to pull it up because I do want to make like somebody else watch these. Cause I know very few people who've mm-hmm. actually seen these box sets, but we haven't like hit the right theme yet. Yeah. I- I'm definitely excited to, you got to start brainstorming themes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? If we base next week's poll off of the popularity of it, he's kind of a clown. So, you know, <laughs> there you go. There is like the films in there about a clown, but in general, you know, we play off the word clown. But anyways, highly recommend those. Awesome. So I think that's it for news on the March. Mm-hmm. So uh, guys, are we ready to go ahead and move into our feature review for it? Chapter two. Let's yes. do this. All right. Something happens to you when you leave this town. The farther away, the hazier it all gets. But me, 
and have left. I remember all of it. All right, so as always with our reviews of theatrical movies that are currently in the theater, we will be doing a non-spoiler section followed by a spoiler section. So at first, we'll be speaking very generally about the film, won't give any spoilers or major plot details away. So if you haven't seen It Chapter 2 yet, you can continue to listen, and then we will give you a spoiler warning and a bumper so you have plenty of time to pause the podcast, not get anything spoiled, and go see It Chapter 2. That's right. Okay, guys, It Chapter 2, directed by Andy Muschietti, starring Muschietti. Jessica Chat. What? That's Muschietti. Muschietti? Well, too many too many letters in there for that. <laughs> Wasn't that a Robert Rodriguez movie? Muschietti? Andy Muschietti? Yeah. Son of Muschietti. Muschietti. <laughs> Son of Annie, Andy Muschietti. <laughs> that may be the worst joke that's been on this podcast. Mm, anyways, letters mean <laughs> things, guys, when making your names. Remember that. All right. Starring Jessica Chastain, James McAvoy, and Bill Hader, the IMDb synopsis says, 27 years after their first encounter with the terrifying Pennywise, the Losers Club have grown up, moved away, until a devastating phone call brings them back. Okay, guys, who wants to get us started on their thoughts for It Chapter 2? I can go. All right. I love the enthusiasm. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. All right, I guess I, I want to start off talking a little bit about the first one. I, I really like the first one. I thought it was really good. We It came out around the time we started the podcast, and I think Justin and I may have talked about it. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. was your, uh, like, in your top 10 that year, wasn't it, Justin? I believe that was a top five that we did that year because we had just started the okay, podcast. Yeah. Yeah. But it was in my top five. But yeah, I really enjoyed it when I watched it. I th- I thought it was really good and a, a really smart way to adapt Stephen King's It. <laughs> but going into the film, uh, I was really excited about it. And this film is very long, guys. And I, I actually kind of felt the length in this. You know, like there's parts of it where it felt big <laughs> and bloated. And like maybe they could have cut some things out. It's it's This film's doing a lot of work having to reintroduce all the characters together again and then they separate again and then they all come back together again type of thing a a really interesting film i think (laughs) but it's big and bloated i think there are a lot of things that are uh wrong with this film or things that they could have done better like a where maybe like an edit would have fixed it a little bit more but what i will say is 
even despite all those things, when I left the theater, I don't know that I've ever had a movie make me feel like I had just read a Stephen King book as much as this one. Um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, because a lot of his books are big and bloated and could use an edit. So like leaving the theater, I was like, man, this is exactly what I would feel like if I had read this book. Uh, I haven't ever read the book It. So I'm not sure on this one, but a lot of his books are, are fairly similar. And I've had this experience where like, when I read books, oftentimes I get to a certain point where I can't stop reading. And it doesn't matter what time it is, I've got to finish the book because I got to know what happens, right? And so this feels like uh, a late night reading session. Like I've gotten too far and I, I end up staying up all night yeah, <laughs> reading the whole It's four in the morning, you can, you can hear the birds chirping. Yeah. And you need to go to bed. But yeah. I've got to finish it. And th that's exactly right. And so leaving the theater, even despite all of this movie's flaws, I was like, this is probably the best adaptation of King or the best adaptation of the experience of reading a Stephen King book that you can get. Um, <laughs> th there are definitely flaws in it, and we can get into those more. But I, I enjoyed this film. I, I know that there's like detractors of it and stuff like that, but I, I think this is a solid film um, and enjoyable. So, yeah, th those are my thoughts. Who wants to go next? I can go. Like Chris, I also enjoyed the first movie when it came out, so I was looking forward to this. Uh, when it was released, I saw the reviews weren't as good as the first one, uh, which is a shame. So my excitement lowered a little bit, but I was still very much looking forward to it. I ended up enjoying it. I'm pretty much in agreement that it's not as good as the first one, but it's fine. Um, even good in some places. With some editing, I feel like it could be really good. And and mostly it's not even the length that bothers me so much as it's the pacing within that length. I never mind long movies, right? Like that's never bothered me. I'm not I don't shy away from three hour movies. Yeah. It's when you start to feel it that it's Yeah, it's you. when you feel it. It's when the pacing doesn't keep up that it starts to kind of um feel different. So I feel like that could have been better. But yeah, I think where I end up is that it's flawed, but still very much worth seeing. I think there's some good performances in here, and I think there are some performances that would have been better suited to other actors, but I can leave that for more specifics later. So that's where I'm at. I would say it's good, but not as good as the first one. But if you liked the first one, uh, watch it, finish it. It's definitely satisfying. Um, it feels like the ending to that story just a little uneven in places mm -hmm. yeah so um more to come in spoilers i have some thoughts about some missteps that i think the movie takes but also some things it does right so before we get into any of that justin what do you think about it chapter two i mean i'm not that far off from you guys as chris said the first one ch chapter one was in my top five of the year that year i really really like the film a lot way more than I ever expected to because I have never seen the original version of it or read the book so I really had no yeah. idea what to expect uh, it just kind of came out in this world of like remakes and adaptations so I just kind of rolled my eyes at it until I saw it and it surprised the hell out of me basically <laughs> um, I thought all the characters were like very very likable in the first one all the kids were relatable and fun and funny and interesting pennywise was a pretty great villain in my opinion yeah yeah and so the second one i was excited for like you guys it's it's not as good as the first one i have reasons why i think it's not as good as the first one part of it is that i think the adults in this situation isn't as compelling as kids because some things come off when it's next to an adult to me, like it just comes across as like kind of sillier because I'm not, I'm not viewing it from like the trying to like put myself in a kid's perspective on things like mm -hmm. the, the sure. kids, the kids aren't my gateway. It's like now it's adults who are older than me. Yeah. So I think just like seeing the film through their perspective and them being like the main characters makes some of I, I would say like the scarier stuff, some of the things that happen in it kind of lose some impact for me. Yeah, it's like they replace the horror of the situations with the PTSD of the situations, right? 
the adults have to lean more on like the fear of their childhood memories coming back versus like the fear of the situation happening and unfolding in the moment, right? Right. You're saying that's what happens in the movie or that's what should happen? Yeah, like in Ed Chapter 2, they rely more on like the PTSD angle versus the actual fear of what's happening in the moment a lot. Like it's a lot of like the dread of Pennywise in the second one versus like the actual Pennywise fucking with them the whole movie, right? Sure, yeah, and, and, then, and then there are definitely times in the movie where they are encountering the real Pennywise, and I, I think I'm talking about those times that just felt kind of a little more bland and less interesting to me. Right, yeah, I, I agree, and I think that's why they have to rely so much on like the PTSD. Like, so much of Bill's story is um, dealing with like the trauma of what he like. It's like he hasn't evolved mentally since the first one, right. The, their PTSD is keeping them in like a, a perpetual state of like not being able to move on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I guess to finish off my, my general thoughts, I do think the film is really enjoyable to watch. I actually never felt the length. Uh, I like, I didn't realize how it was how long it was until I got out of the theater and checked my watch. And I was <laughs> like, oh, wow, this was almost three hours long. Goodness. Uh, so, so like that didn't necessarily seem to get to me i do have places where i i don't understand why we spent either like so much time on a moment or a scene or there were certain things that happened that didn't add up to anything so i do have feelings of like things that could have been cut but i didn't feel those in the moment like i thought it was pretty enjoyable i think a lot of it is carried by the humor that they add into the film as far as i remember i think this one's funnier than the first one yeah, yeah I, would, I think so too. Well, I would say um, I think both are just about as funny, but I think this one's trying harder to be funny. Right. I don't know. I just I just think that there's a little bit magic that is lost going from kids to adults. Like I just uh, there's imagine like the Goonies all grown up going back on like a pirate hunt treasure chest. Like it just seem a little less like less magical and a little less fun. And I kind of feel that with uh, chapter two. So that's that's where I'm at. It's I still think it's good. And overall, it's a great thing. And, and I'm super glad that this has come out because I actually bought it really cheaply at Half Price Books. And I've been <laughs> waiting to read it because I didn't want to spoil anything for chapter two. And I've, I think I've had it for the, the book version for like a year sitting on my shelf. So I'm very happy that this is out and I've seen it now. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I know for a fact it's a lot weirder. Yeah. Yeah. Which I look forward to. I don't. I don't mind the weirdness. Let me ask you guys this: uh, There is talks of you know a super uber cut, uh, you know, like a six-hour cut where it it follows the book a little bit more closely. You know, so the adults come back and they're flashing back more to the original story, mm-hmm. l- a little bit more similar to the book. Uh, how do you guys feel about that? Uh, are you guys interested in watching these two movies cut together, or not? I think it could make the structure of this thing seem a lot better because in chapter one, it felt refreshing to not have any of like the flashing forward or flashing back stuff. And it was Mm -hmm. all just the kids, you know? Yeah. In this movie, less so because it seems like there's a lot of flashbacks that really should have been set up in the first one. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to go through like sometimes five to seven to eight to 10 minute scenes. It feels like of like, this is your horror that you've been carrying around with you the whole time that Pennywise can exploit. But really, you haven't been thinking about that as an audience for the last two years because we didn't show it to you in part one. Right. We're, we're showing it to you now. Sometimes it really worked. Like all the James McAvoy stuff with Bill's character, you know, every time he brought up Georgie. Mm-hmm. Plenty of setup in the first one for that to land for me, right? Yeah. yeah. But then there are some things that are added with like, let's say... um Bill Hader's character, Richie, that could have been really, really interesting, but it wasn't set up in the first one at all. And I'll talk more in spoilers about specifics. But basically, the thing is, is like, I feel like they needed to give everyone an arc in this movie to make it satisfying, Mm -hmm. but they didn't do enough groundwork in the first one to set up everyone getting their own arc. Yeah, there are several of them that feel like afterthoughts. Yeah, for chapter two. Yeah, so I'm with you on that. Right. So to answer Chris's question, I feel like if they were to release like a super cut or like um, a re-jumble this thing and re-edit this thing into a miniseries or something like that, a la Hateful Eight from Netflix, you know, something like that, 
I feel like this could be better. Some of the scenes that they shot and de-aged the kids for in part two, I feel like if you sprinkled those in in chronological order into like the first one a little bit more, and you're kind of watching this all in one go round, it might flow a little bit better. But I'm not sure. It might also be really jarring because it might be really obvious the kids are being de-aged. Possible. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking that it would make the first movie worse. But the overall experience better. Yes. Yeah, that's fair. I don't it, think this... it would make it significantly worse, right? Because I, yeah. I think those scenes that all the flashbacks that I'm referring to that don't really jive well in this movie, they're good scenes. They're not bad. Like, none of them are performed bad. They're not bad memories for them to look back on, you know? Mm-hmm. If anything, if you're not going to change the order and do some kind of supercut like we were referring to, I think just taking this movie and trying, like, giving yourself the goal to trim 15 minutes out of it here and there. Like, don't cut any specific scenes, but trim every scene. <laughs> just a yeah. little bit, right? Like, a few seconds here and there, I think could really help the pacing for this movie overall. I agree. So what do you, what do you think about Chris's question about the supercut of all of it together? I think Chris hit the nail on the head with saying that it'll make the first one worse, but the overall experience better and improve the second one. And they'll, they'll kind of meet more in the middle. I think yeah. for, for all the reasons that we're saying, I mean, it definitely has to be some sort of mini series thing for it to be digestible for most people. So I think the one thing that I did hear about this film before going into it kind of unanimously said was that, Bill Hader's performance is really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was my favorite. Yeah, okay. So we, you guys agree with that? Yeah, I was actually about to ask you guys what you thought of Bill Hader. I think, um, just real quick before you answer it, I'll give my thoughts. Between this and Barry, I think he is continuing to be one of the most interesting actors who can balance comedy with drama, seemingly effortlessly sometimes. Um, I think... He has a um, humbleness about him and a genuineness about him that is really effective. Yeah, agreed. I don't know. I, I really responded to him in this movie. I all I only wish um, there had been more set up for his arc that he goes on in uh, chapter one. Yeah, we can talk about that in spoilers. I definitely want to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what do you guys think about Bill Hader? Um, you were kind of setting it up, Justin. I don't know if you're going to like spin this on me and be like, he sucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh no 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 like his character has things overall as we just mentioned that you know make it make it not as great but the performance itself is like spot on and really carries the movies there's some scenes that without him in there i think could have been significantly worse so like he keeps picking up like all of the movie every time he comes back in it basically yeah. and like reinvigorating yeah. life into it when it starts to lose it and I think he's the strongest performer in the movie. Yeah. And I, it just makes me really see that, like he might just be this sort of unexpected powerhouse of like a actor. Yeah, I'm certainly down to see him in more dramatic things. Like if people want to hire Bill Hader for uh drama or dramedies, please do. I'm I'm there for it, you know. Yeah, I I guess I just went in with you know, James McAvoy has the Bill character Jessica Chastain uh, has, uh, what's her name? The Bev. Bev. Beverly. Yeah, which are two of the best characters from the original one. So I expect, oh, we got James McAvoy and Jessica Chastain in here. Like, they're going to go off. But I think just Bill Hader outshines everybody, which is interesting. Yeah, he steals the show for sure. Yeah. I actually think Jessica Chastain was not the right choice. I kind of have thought that. I think she is the most uninspired performance in the movie. Interesting. And I think that's what happens when you let Reddit cast your movie for you. <laughs> well, I think it actually worked. Um, I was going to say that the casting, and I, I don't disagree with you about Jessica Chastain. Uh, as far as like looks go, Bill Hader, like a lot of these actors look a lot like oh, man. the younger. guy that got to play Ben. <laughs> yeah. Um, even though he's supposed to be like grown up and not as like pudgy as he used to be. And he's supposed to be handsome now. Mm hmm. It looks like the kid who played Ben, like the eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's crazy how much it looked like him. Yeah. Eddie was the one for me. Oh, man. Yeah. They were all <laughs> they really looked, good, except for yeah, Jessica they, Chastain. Well, well, 
I think she looks like her character. I don't. I um, think it would have been better with a uh, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard. Yeah, I mean, she I looks think more like the the teenager. But sure. I think Jessica Chastain's chin doesn't look right, and her nose doesn't look right. Uh, I mean, that's fine. To it's me, like if but... Bev had plastic surgery. Right. <laughs> and maybe she did, because I don't know if you saw her closet in the first time, like the first scene we see her in, but that was a massive closet. Yeah, she she very uh, she married a very rich and crappy guy. Yeah, she's doing well. <laughs> but I, I think part of the problem, well, it's, and it's not a huge problem, but part of the problem is that it feels like the actors were cast to visually look like the actors before they were, before like being great performers. Yeah. I think they look like freckles and red hair. Yeah. They get Jessica Chastain. Right. And I think they lucked out with Bill Hader and yeah. James Ransone playing Eddie. Uh, everybody mm-hmm. else, like, I think, uh, you know, I don't see those performances as like, they knocked it out of the park. No one could have done that, but them like I do with like Bill Hader sure. and James uh, Ransone that they're just incredible. And so I think like, as you said, I think you you put it well that like Reddit cast it because everyone was like, these are the actors that need to play the it child, the the, the grown up version of the kids from it. And mm-hmm. I don't know. It seemed like the casting went with that way rather than for some chemistry or great performances. Sure. And, and I and I don't think Jessica Chastain's performance is bad. I've ragged on her a lot in this. Yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of people, it's like, who's a redheaded actress I know? Oh, Jessica Chastain. She's good. She'll be great in it. And it's like, she just has red hair. <laughs> yeah, she got red hair. Check. Yeah, overall, I think they're all good performances. I think the chemistry is really where, uh, you mentioned it, where I see some things lacking. Right. Yeah, the the characters, um, Richie and Eddie, like, perfect. I think they were pitch perfect the whole time. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine anything better than for those two, you know? Yeah, agreed. And I'll tell you what, some of the performances they filmed for the flashback scenes, like of uh, young Eddie, mm-hmm. <laughs> the scene where he's going like downstairs into the basement of the pharmacy and he like he walks into like the corridor to like go down the stairs and he bumps into like a table and screams. Yeah. <laughs> Comic gold. Yeah, that kid is wonderful. That kid, I could watch that kid for hours just be stressed out about stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's great. It just makes me laugh thinking about it, like his scream from like sheer panic to realizing there's nothing to worry about and then acting nonchalant about it is just, (laughs) I don't know, is just wonderful to watch. And um, I hope that kid pops up in more stuff. Yeah. Well, how scary was the movie to you guys? Not scary, but neither was the first one. But I would say I think if I were the type of person to get scared in movies like this, I would say the scares seem to be more effective in this one. There's a couple of jump scares that got me that yeah. I'm surprised got me at that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, oh, you like jump and you're like, wow, that got me. I don't know how that, that happened. You know? Yeah. There's a lot more comedy in this one, but I also think that like the, um, the horror elements are a little more, a little darker, I guess, but maybe that's just because like, the first one was like little kids. So like, as long as I was watching them be scared, I was scared, you know? Right. I think where I will say that the film was successful, at least to me, is there are times where it built up suspense. And I guess I'm so used to other horror films building up that suspense. And then when like the climax happens and like, it's either it's a jump scare and then you see what was there. Usually I get kind of let down. I'm kind of like, Oh, okay. that that's what I expected or that's like about what I expected. There were a couple moments in this film that once the buildup happened and we hit that jump scare moment and then the things that happened after it still like surprised me and went to a level beyond what I expected. <laughs> the opening um, surprised me. Yeah. With, with the hate crime. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> like it just like, the bluntness and the brutality and the directness of it, I think. Um, I was like, wow, we're just going straight into this, something like this, you know? Yeah. That surprised me. And I was like, I don't know if that was good or bad or like what that opening was, but. Yeah, the opening is really weird. And I probably want to talk about it in conjunction with some other stuff uh, in spoilers, too, uh, because I find the opening interesting and then tied into something else in the movie too. I think it's, it's an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah. And, um, real quick, but 
I don't have a whole lot else before spoilers, but I will just say that um, jumping off what I kind of said on the opening, I think there's a lot in this movie. That, like they try to throw at the screen and a lot of it doesn't have time to properly give it a lot of subtlety. Sure. So a lot of times you're just thrown into these big ideas uh, or challenging ideas and you're just kind of thrown in there without a whole lot of emotional resonance. And that might actually tie into a lot of stuff that should have been set up in chapter one. I don't know. You know, I guess we can talk about more into spoilers, but yeah. For sure. But I'm ready to move into spoilers. Okay. So real quick, before we move into spoilers, I, out of five, I'm sitting at a three and a half out of five right now. Um, That's kind of where I'm at. What are you guys thinking? Uh, I'm at a three. I, I I think it's a a solid fun movie, but I, I don't think it's so you're not you're not recommending it necessarily. I mean, three is a recommendation to me. Um, is it? Yeah, <laughs> like two and a half would be like only if I know the person. Like this is two and a half is a bad movie. No, two and a half is an uh, okay well, movie. It's like average. Yeah. I think like, three is an okay movie. Well, three is a solid movie to me. Audience, I, we we right need to in. talk about our star on a scale of <laughs> yeah. one to five. What do you consider to be okay, and what do you consider to be the minimum? the of where the movie is actually officially bad yeah two and a half is like to me it's like bad. it has good ideas but it, like there's something wrong with the um execution, like execution of those ideas okay. uh so i'd recommend it to somebody two is like oh man you know like only if you really want to and anything below that's probably two. don't war- bother interesting okay um yeah was, yeah okay two and a half by definition is average on a five star <laughs> rating yeah, system so to me like <laughs> an average movie that's just okay is two and a half two is like it's just it's right on the side of not good three is like it's just right on the side of being good hmm. Hmm. okay and three and a half starts to creep up onto exceptional you know like uh what? three and a half that's four. crazy you still have a star and a half before exceptional what do you do after exceptional no four is exceptional five you said three is and like, a half is creeping up on being exceptional yeah three and a half is creeping up on it four so it's just is good ex- <laughs> okay all right good better than average i guess yeah so then th- uh four is exceptional five is like masterpiece what like, about four and a half well four and a half forget except four and a half, you go know. from exceptional to masterpiece with nothing in between you have a whole what about anyway. eight and a half can we talk about that like, for a while anyways this is insane i know the problem with star rating systems i know yeah arbitrary and dumb <laughs> all right are we ready what, to what, go ahead justin's real quick since we haven't gotten oh news. yeah shit Although we've said that they don't matter. <laughs> yeah, so I'm at a three and a half out of five stars as well. With The first one would have been four out of five stars for me. Like a really So by Chris's rating four. system, that means it's the best movie ever. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what it means? Yeah. Move over. I feel like specifically I did not say that. Move over Citizen Kane and or Vertigo. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> it chapter two. Okay, let's go to spoilers. Let's go. Okay, I got to pee. No, I guess Rosebud is just a... Piece and a jigsaw puzzle. The cigarettes you got up there, I'll tell you all about it. Things are going to start happening to me now. And here we go. All right, so we, you were kind of talking about the hate crime at the beginning, and then that kind of tied in with Bill Hader's arc as well, because Bill Hader is, is a closeted homosexual. And so there's this kind of underlying thing the hate crime that happens at the beginning never kind of gets any resolution or any like they just never revisit it again and i think there was an opportunity to tie it in with bill Hader's arc as well but they don't i don't know how do you guys feel about that like the like i could have been more um powerful like if they had have tied that in together somehow or thematically it had been something i don't agree that well i mean i see your point and you're not wrong if they could have found some way to do it. But I didn't necessarily get the impression that like, oh, missed opportunity. They didn't tie in these um, similar themes as well as they could have. With me, at the beginning of the movie, the the hate crime, my problem with it is it seems to escalate in a cartoonish level very quickly. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and if this took place in like 1950 or 1960 or something like that, that might be a little bit more believable, right? But like this was um these these new movie adaptations were made to where this isn't taking place in the fifties and the eighties. It's taking place in the eighties and also like twenty seventeen or something like that or or whatever. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like that reaches um, melodramatic places very quickly without a whole lot of subtlety or setup for it. Right. And I feel a similar way about not necessarily Bill Hader's character, although I do have stuff I want to talk about with his arc in a minute. But what the opening hate crime reminded me of was a, a scene that comes very quickly after that with adult Beverly. She's married to an abusive husband. And we get maybe 90 seconds with that husband before he turns into like stereotypical abusive husband from a movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I feel the same way about the um, the people who do the the hate crime, the, the gay bashing at the beginning of the movie. Is it, it seems like they're in a hurry to get through the scene, but they're not willing to spend the time to like set up the tension it it goes from like zero to a hundred really quickly right i I think it's supposed to i think dairy's supposed to be like just this rotting cesspool and i think that that's kind of what they're trying to establish there but it doesn't they don't establish it but jessica chastain's character doesn't live in dairy i'm not talking about her specifically i'm talking about the the hate crime uh, and I, I, with the hate crime, I think they're trying to set up that this is just kind of like the cesspool. And right. That Pennywise but what I'm is... saying is my problem with the hate crime and my problem with Beverly's marriage are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. It's that they're trying to do too much melodrama too quickly without proper um, Work. nuance or yeah. establishing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're just go, they're just trying to throw you into the drama because they have so much to get through with this movie that they have to just book it. You know what I mean? And everything has to be efficient and they have to get to the next scene. And I think that's to its detriment. I agree that that particular moment with Jessica Chastain is detrimental to the movie because it's underdeveloped. I think what they're going for is that her relationship with her dad has led her, you know, to be in this relationship. And I get that. But the problem for me is we leave chapter one with her having stood up and and everybody stood up to it and faced their fears and, overcome some of their challenges so that was the last time i saw her in chapter one and now when i see her in chapter two she's just in the same situation like it's it's almost like she did did what happened between chapter one and two to put her in this place well they lost their memories too right so maybe that's part of it yeah i mean i guess that's part of it but i don't know that at the time so it seems very melodramatic (laughs) and seems like what again kind of out of nowhere and quick so i'm with you uh, I'm with you on the underdevelopment. If they would have referenced it, if, like if she would have had like a conversation with Bill or Ben, um, the two people that she spends the most time with in the movie, like if she'd have had a conversation with one of them about her marriage at some point in the movie, but it seems like a one-off scene to set her character up. Yeah, there's some scene where she talks about, she, talk, she doesn't talk about it, but she just comments on like, yeah, I, I was married or I am you know that and that's it so she she mentions it but like she doesn't talk about right. the situation how that has affected her or any of her feelings or thoughts on it right and and there's a version of this movie where that could still be good because uh subtlety is always good right giving your audience credit is always good but i think there is um some underdevelopment or some undercooked plot lines i guess that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way yeah where i think if they had just been uh, addressed in a different way or um even staged in a more subtle way yeah like imply the abuse don't make him just fly off the handle like a cartoon yeah. character and then like get into <laughs> right, like right. a knockdown drag out fight where they're breaking yeah. stuff yeah it's like yeah where she has to like run away in the rain with the door open like yeah. that is just full-on soap opera to a degree <laughs> yeah like the impression that gives me when that is my only scene with them is that this is just their relationship. So I'm looking at it like, why isn't everything in their house broken? Because as far (laughs) as I know, this is, this is what they do. (laughs) Yeah. It's so, this movie is doing so much work, especially on the front half of this movie, because we got to re reintroduce all the characters. So, you know, we go to each character, spend a little bit of time with them, spend a little bit of time with their family. You know, like you're right, Mike, it's, it's like, we got to get to the next thing. And it, that first part feels so rushed, which is, you know, amazing because it's a two and a half hour movie. Yeah. You know, like it's all, or it's three hour movie. So, but that first part feels so rushed and they can't take their time with it. Like, like they probably should, you know, like, yeah. uh, it's like this movie's just, in a hurry to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. And if we can go back to the opening hate crime incident, the one thing that I wanted to add in there about it is that 
you know, I thought that they were going to set something up with that. And so it didn't necessarily bother me in the beginning. It did seem melodramatic and like it escalated quickly, but in a similar way to Chris saying that it, it was maybe establishing dairy as this cesspool and people are terrible and sure. dairy. Uh, right. I don't think it ended up doing that. And basically it feels like this one off because it never pays off in any way at all. The fact that it is a hate crime. It's what I kind of expected and the way that I think it could have paid off. Like for example is, you know, they defeat Pennywise in chapter one He's gone. The thing that allows him to thrive is fear. And this hate crime, like if that happening in Derry could have like established fear, like establishing like, because Pennywise also seems to thrive on like the, the mental hospital guy. Bauer. Yeah. Who's Bauer. And like the first one, he seems to like be able to take advantage and thrive of those people. So like those gay bashing people are like the perfect catalyst for Pennywise to be able to thrive to me they just they have it happen and they drop off they don't establish it or pay it off in any way like that and so I think to me that makes that whole scene feel like making it a hate crime just to make a hate crime in the film and that, that it really bugged me and it's the one thing that like I dislike most about the movie coming out of it yeah because it seemed it seems lazy yeah and to use to be lazy and use a hate crime is even worse, right? <laughs> you know, like it's like kind of a double. Well, it's whammy. like uh, taking a hot button issue for the sake of taking a hot button issue, right? It's right. Like, yeah. Ooh, this is maybe not as controversial or edgy as it was in the '80s when the book was written. It still works for what we need it for. Um, Justin, based on what you're saying, would you have liked it more if it had implied that this particular crime was so heinous that that was the catalyst for waking Pennywise up again. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I expected. I don't know that that's yeah. it being that literal is better because he was already there, but yeah, you know, if that's, if that's the thing that makes him grow stronger and be more powerful this time is that kind yeah. of thing existing. I think that I would like that. Yeah. That makes sense. I think there's a lot of things in this film like, the 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 hate crime at the beginning that don't pay off uh i think bauer is one of them i think you can kind of eliminate bauer for the most part from this movie and it's still a good movie the little kid uh it has a payoff at the end but it it doesn't work for me at all <laughs> you know like i thought felt- the little kid that um keeps getting yelled at by all the adults yeah. <laughs> yes I, I, it keeps walking up and then all the adults like the kid has no idea what's going on but james mcavoy is like go back home get as far away from dairy as you can you know like <laughs> and uh, <laughs> poor yeah. kid you know lie to your parents do whatever you have yeah. to do yeah i don't think that that pays off super well i, I don't know there's th- is that kid even movie- real yeah i think, I think so. so yeah because he he lives in the parents house in, the, in james mm-hmm. mcavoy's house but Bill. even the parents and the family that was with him didn't seem real like Bill Hader grabs their kid, shakes him, screams and swears at him in public. <laughs> They're just like, come on, son. And they don't even like say anything to Bill Hader's character. Yeah. And then later when the kid's murdered in the fair, the only one that seems to notice the murder is James McAvoy. Right. So it just seems like Pennywise messing with them. Yeah, it's a good sequence. I, I think the kid's real. I mean, at least that's what I, mean, I took away be. from yeah. it. Yeah, I, I think it would work better if he wasn't. I don't think he was, but I, I don't know that it matters either way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also the the kid is there to bring guilt back right. for Bill for James McAvoy's character, but right, he also gets that because Eddie dies. Yeah, and I, but we also get that in the basement, like where you know um, he's talking to his his brother, and he has to deal with it in that way. Yeah, but, but he like he doesn't want anyone else to die because of Pennywise, right. essentially. Yeah. So yeah. we He's already the surrogate get a, Georgie. Yeah, basically. And I just think we already get another death with Eddie and we already have uh, Stan who kills himself in the beginning. And so it's just like, it just seems like one more unnecessary sort of step that we take. Well, it's the motivating factor to get them all to the house. Like it's weird because this movie, like they're all separate. They come together. They separate again. <laughs> yes. And then they come together. 
and then they almost separate, but then they stay together. And it's like this really weird thing. And, and, and I started feeling the length of the movie during the second time they split up and they were all going to get their like childhood possessions, you know? Mm-hmm. And I was like, are we going to do this for every one of these guys? Yeah, that's what I thought. And I was like, <laughs> oh, we are. OK. And, and then <laughs> like I accepted it and then it was OK. But like that's when I started feeling the length of the movie. And I think the pacing during that scene where they're all going to their own separate traumas, you know, and getting their own individual items. That should have all been quicker, quicker paced, I think, and cutting between yeah. them all. I, I think that would have made a stronger um, pacing. For the movie. Some of those sequences are really good too. Like I like the Eddie sequence um, with his mom. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Yeah, um, I, because and the way that the younger actor says "mommy," you know, like and it's it's like that just adds the this to the scariness and the dread because yeah. the way he says it is so uh, childlike and uh, sure. uh, yeah. Anyways, so I I, I like that one. I, well, that's I the thing like is like I don't Bill dislike Hader. any of those yeah. flashback scenes. I just think they would have been better served in chapter one had they already been gestating in my memory for two years. Right. All of the things that they went to grab should have been things from chapter one. Right. Like we should have already been thinking about Richie having a crush on Eddie. Yeah. For two yeah. years. Instead of trying to like spring that on us. You know what I mean? Yeah. I kind of actually think that's why what makes the first one good is because it's not tied to the second one, right? Like, I think if they had to add that stuff in there, it may be a better, uh, like a better story overall, right? But I think it would have made the first one less good. Does that make sense? It does, but there are examples of how they did it correctly for their the things that they have to go get, the little sacrificial official items that they have to go get, right? It's like the poem the postcard with the poem and the okay, and yeah. the yearbook thing were things that organically in the toy boat. were in yeah exactly where those were organically in chapter one we still have scenes where they go get them uh but they're they're shorter because we don't we don't have to have this like six seven minute scene in a clubhouse to establish that one character got shower caps for everybody so they didn't have spiders in their hair right <laughs> like that's a long <laughs> yeah. time to get to that point like Everyone who wasn't Bill and Bev didn't have their um their items properly set up. Like Mike was a nothing character in chapter one. Richie was like the funny one, but he didn't have any like closeted feelings that were hinted towards. You know what I mean? Like, and mm-hmm. you may be able to go back and watch chapter one now and see hints if they were if they were planning to go that way. There may be subtle hints, but that wasn't something that was in my mind. So whenever the adult versions of them were undergoing their trauma, I was like. Oh, he's undergoing trauma about a clubhouse I didn't know existed. Right. That apparently they hung out a lot in. You know what I mean? Like, Beverly's made sense because she was in the stall. Uh, we saw that stall. She got trash dumped on her in the very first scene we saw of her in that stall. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know what I mean? We That basement and Georgie and that drain pipe where their bill goes to have lots of moments that I'll never forget from Mid Chapter 1. Oh, yeah, by the way, Richie also did stuff. And by the way, like... You know, this character, um, what's the one that killed himself, Kenny? Stanley. Yeah, it's like these characters, um, I feel like they were more of afterthoughts. And I feel like it makes It Chapter 1 in retrospect, I don't want to say less good, but less thought out. Right. Because they should have known that they were going to need to lay track for all the characters being important. Yeah. Yeah. I, I listened to an interview with the director and they were asking about the second one and and the first one and did he was he planning on doing the second one and uh, he really wasn't you know until after the movie did really well and then he's like oh you know like I would love to do a second one type of thing so he I think he was more focused on that first movie yeah, and what, one step what will at make a time. this first yeah what will it make this movie good. Uh, which I think is kind of the way you should do it especially if you don't know there's going to be a second one because yeah. So, so yeah, you know, like it's probably down to what you just said, Chris, that they didn't know they were going to make a second one until the first one was successful. So they made, they didn't like have, this but that's crazy out. to me. I mean, they knew they were cutting out half the book when they chose to adapt it. So like, you know, the studio, at least some producer would have been like, Hey, by the way, if this even remotely breaks, even we're green lighting it chapter two. Yeah. But you don't want to necessarily hamstring your film. Not that it would have made it worse, but it's possible that it would have made it worse. You want to focus like 
Where Maybe. I know that I'm going to get to make this film. I, I don't know about the next one. You Could know, like, be, but I mean, it ends. The first one ends with end of it, chapter one, implying that they are planning on doing it, chapter two, implying that the story is not done yet. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, I would agree with you had they not chose to end it that way. Yeah. I don't even remember that. <laughs> yeah, it, it literally ends with like end of it, and then chapter one fades on the screen. So yeah. like that's the end of the movie. So they were already when opening weekend they were being like, "All right, here we go, gearing up for that second one." Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, you mentioned this earlier and I just want to see Mike what you think, but the whole storyline with Bauer getting out of the mental institution with like the knife and um how did you feel about that, Mike? Did that seem as irrelevant? Mm, I think it would have been stronger had he gone after Ben. Because if I remember correctly from the first one, Bauer and Eddie, who he ends up stabbing in the second one, they never meet. He torments Ben. He carves like his name or whatever, or starts carving his name into Ben's like um, belly fat in the first sure, one, right? Yeah, which they reference. Yeah, they reference and there's even the scar in it. So if you're going to bring that character back to torment the adult losers, it seems like a missed opportunity to not have him torment the one a um, member of the losers club that we saw him interact with in the first one. Yeah. And to not, to like set him up as a disciple minion of it and then not have him live to the climax or to the scene where he can at least be in the same place as it with these people seems weird. Like it just seems so <laughs> weird when he actually got yeah. killed. And I was like, Oh, I think it would have been better had he actually done something effective. Like, yeah, yeah, because we saw him like if he'd actually killed one of them or like created some sort of problem for them that was successful. But instead, he just like he tries to kill one of them one time. It doesn't work. He tries to kill another one of them another time and it doesn't work. And then he dies. Yeah. Yeah. If we had a known if you had a, had a mission like or we had a known what yeah. the mission was, if it was like there were some, you know, destroy the dam because I want to destroy the town of Derry or like, yeah, or like fuck with their cars <laughs> or, or you know what I mean? Like stalk them somehow, like yeah. let them know that someone's stalking them and that they're being watched. You know what I mean? Like foil yeah. their plans in some way <laughs> instead of just like two attempted murders that don't work out. And then he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and there are some moments that work with that character. You know, like I, I particularly like the moment he gets in the car and there's like a, a corpse hanging out. Yeah, like his it's friend. his old friend, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, and I think those moments are cool, but they, once again, they don't pay off. There's not uh, anything that, that, pays off at the end because of it you know so i i kind of feel like i could just get rid of the whole thing and the movie would be fine yeah that's what that's where i'm at yeah i mean i liked it as it was going on i just whenever he ended up dying i was like oh that's it bummer so (laughs) yeah yeah i think there's a good amount of that in the film of like things when they're going on i'm like all right let's see where this goes i'm i'm along for this ride and then you it it once you look back on it you're like okay that i didn't really go anywhere (laughs) <laughs> yeah agreed <laughs> yeah just some half-baked stuff that i think um i talked about this in my opening but like that's what a, reading a stephen king book is like sometimes <laughs> you know like uh there's half-baked stuff you know like uh it just it doesn't always it's not always neat and tidy the interesting thing actually is so stephen king wrote this book when he was like in the middle of his addiction you know like yeah. drugs and Crazy alcohol drugs. so yeah this is a crazy book that he wrote like a fever dream you know like high on something you know typing everything out so that might explain why there's so much you know like and and the books go oftentimes his books reach thousands of pages so yep. so some of the, like the things that i was talking about earlier the sequences that surprised me i just want to touch on a couple of those more specifically the scene with jessica chastain and the old woman in the apartment yeah for sure like, I was genuinely surprised and shocked, like at the thing that came out, you know, and just like how big mm-hmm. and like it was actually pretty terrifying. Oh man, that first shot where um she's like in the background watching Jessica Chastain look at the pictures, yeah, and then she turns around to like walk out of frame, but she like does that like comical clown walk, the, like, she's like twitch kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was just like almost like um that episode of Arrested Development when Tobias like tries to turn the corner and like run like a cartoon. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> throwing the leg up and like. <laughs> swinging the arms you know it's just like so creepy and bizarre the way it's done in the movie yeah definitely i i really like that whole scene and then i was also 
genuinely kind of like, oh shit, like what the fuck? <laughs> this is crazy. The scene with Bill Hader in the park with the giant Paul Bunyan statue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's kind of funny and silly, like at, at the same time, but just I didn't expect that giant Paul Bunyan, Bunyan statue to like come <laughs> after him. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this yeah. is nuts. It just goes full on bonkers sometimes where you're just like, God, this movie is really going for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the Chinese dinner scene with the fortune cookies and all the monsters coming me. up. Uh, the monsters I thought were um, interesting is what I will say about that. I uh, think if they had parts... looked better, they would have been interesting, but yeah. they looked really bad. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> with Mike on that. I like the, the fortune cookie. I think though, like they like kind of put it together. I think they drug it on way too long. Because it was pretty, yeah. I, I mm-hmm. figured it out. That's what I was saying. A minute Pacing. before they did. <laughs> right, yeah, it's like some scenes don't need to breathe as long as they do. Right. Yeah, that's perfect example right there of the movie. Like, there's probably a good four to five minute scene where they're figuring out the fortune cookie message. And you really only need that to be two. I guess they couldn't cut the scene down. Like, they couldn't cut it, the scene. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah, the editor couldn't cut it. <laughs> Well, if you cut that scene down and then pay off some other stuff, maybe, you know, like pay off Bauer in a, a more you know, powerful I, I way. I think the even the crime. payoff wouldn't even seem so um, empty had the rest of the movie just been paced a little better. I think it's the combination of the two that really make it seem a little weird. And all of this makes it sound like I don't like the movie, but I really do like the yeah. movie, you know. Right. Yeah, it's, it's certainly got its faults like we talked about, but ultimately I walked away enjoying it. Yeah. 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 And I would always be down to watch another cut of this movie. Yeah. The, w- one more thing that I think could have hit the editing room floor that I don't really understand why it's in there. Maybe you guys can enlighten me, but when they're in the drain towards the end going to Pennywise and they get to like the chamber they fought him in and like the first one and they have to go through the water to get up to like the hatch, that weird monster comes and grabs Bev and takes her under and everybody dives in except for Eddie and then they pull her back up, and then they just go back about what they were doing. I think it's just trying to reiterate one more time before Eddie finally conquers his fear and does something heroic that Eddie is um, struggling with his fear. Yeah, but that's a... I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it's not it's clunky, <laughs> but I think that's the purpose of it. Yeah, it just felt like a real waste of time. Didn't like, we get a scene right before that I um uh, that said the same thing? Like uh, the someone's scene about to die in the house uh, where Bill Hader's character was like being attacked and then Eddie was too scared to do anything. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, Bill yells at him. Yeah. But yeah. we just had that. So like, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I agree. I I'm just saying, I think that's why they kept it in <laughs> like, there. To me, they could just go yeah. to the hat, like get in that area, walk past it, be like, ah, this is the creepy place where it happened last time and go to the hatch. I don't know. Down. Maybe they didn't want to make it seem so easy to get to Pennywise. Like there's no obstacles. Once you, once you know the way you can just walk in and find him sleeping. <laughs> Maybe it's like, well, we should probably add at least one obstacle that tries to attack them before getting there. Oh, that was the house. <laughs> well, yeah, but once they're in the sewer, there should be another obstacle, I feel like. That's like entering like the next realm of hell, right? And then like, but then the second realm's easier than the first realm. Yeah. I, I guess in that case, I would like more from that moment then. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, it's, I agree. You know, I, it's in the middle, but I, I yeah. see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it needs to crescendo to being more more and more intense as you get further into hell, right? Not yeah. not easier. What did you guys think about the gag, the like not very scary door, <laughs> the very scary store door? Well, and, like, it was extremely... a callback to the first one. Yeah. Like Was it? Yeah, I like how they opened up the door and like the in the first movie they open up the door and like there's a woman her top half is hanging there. Uh-huh. And in the second movie when they open the door, her bottom half is walking out. So yeah. 27 oh, nice. years later, you see the other half of the woman from the first movie. <laughs> yeah. I hadn't put that together. And they flipped it because the other one, they went in the not very scary door and it was the worst one. So that's why they went in the <laughs> the most scary door this oh, time. Okay. But I, I mean, I did, I love the whole Pomeranian thing. Cause like earlier he was like, what if his like true form is just a Pomeranian? <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> That was funny. Yeah, I like the gag of that. I, I forgot about the first one, but um, I, I thought Bill Hader and uh, the other guy, Eddie, played it off really well. Yeah, I like when they're running away. They're like, screw it. Next time we're just going to choose regular scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one thing that, since we're, we're talking about so many things that like pay off and don't pay off, I was pleasantly surprised with what happened with Stan's character because I was a little disappointed that he just kind of killed himself in the beginning of the movie. 
and it was just one less character we didn't get to like get to know again yeah I, and i guess i felt a lot more satisfied than i expected to with that once like at the end end of the movie when his letter comes back and he's like look guys i was i was too scared to go back and i know that i couldn't go back and i knew that you know it would it would all fail if i didn't go back and i'm i knew i couldn't so like i did this so that you guys could be successful and like it's a big gamble though because what if <laughs> by taking himself out of the equation he just screwed them all to lose no matter what yeah i mean that's fair <laughs> that's fair but emotionally like character wise i was like i was like okay i'm like i like that better than like yeah better than he was just so ptsd that he killed himself yeah i mean it makes sense though his character was a big old wimp from the first one what do you guys think about the ending i think are we there yeah i'm yeah i think so i'm done yeah yeah what about the ending well i was just wondering it it kind of had and i don't dislike it <laughs> but the idea like they just defeat him by yelling at him uh you know bullying him into uh submission like how do you guys feel about that well i mean is it satisfying yes and no i mean we always knew that the only way to defeat him would be conquering your fear of him right like that always had to be the case well, it certainly has the analogy of like getting over childhood trauma. Exactly. You, know, like you have to. Exactly. And that's so much what the theme of the second movie is, is childhood trauma and coming to terms with it. I, I wasn't necessarily satisfied as it was going on, but I don't have my notes on what would have made that better. Right. You know what I mean? Like it has to happen that way. I maybe just a little bit more impressive of a final showdown would have been better. Maybe more casualties would have been better, more more weight i don't know something about it i wasn't completely satisfied but also i'm not feeling like i was robbed of a of a of an ending that felt appropriate yeah yeah i i think i feel the same way as you how about you justin well i think it feels appropriate to me i think just what is appropriate isn't like a great cinema <laughs> necessarily a great like horror <laughs> climax cinema but at least like traditionally speaking so if I take that mm -hmm. step back and I look at it, I, I'm okay with it and I like it because I think more than just like getting over childhood trauma, the whole idea of it is that if you're afraid of it and you are worried about it, it is stronger and has the power over you. And mm -hmm. by standing up against it and standing up together, you can overcome it. And so, and this goes back to the hate crime thing of like, if if it feeds off of these things and that's a little bit more known then like, I think that that whole metaphor of the, the way to defeat hate and fear and evil is to band together and take it down and let it know that it's like, you're nothing, you know, like you are not important. You're not scary. You're not as awesome as you think you are. And like, it can stand in for racism. It can stand in for, you know, gay bashing or, you know, any other. Well, that's why it's thing. called it. Yeah, exactly. And so in that sense, like I like that ending a lot and I like how that ties into that. I, I think that we could have used a little bit more, uh, more like hammering that point home at some other point in the film and connecting those dots yeah. a little better to make that moment feel more satisfying in in the moment. But thinking back on it, like I like it because I, that's what I take away from this whole it thing as a whole, you know, is that message of banding together and like against evil and bad things to defeat it. Like it, it takes people standing up to it and not being afraid to deal with it. Yeah. And that makes sense. And I don't dislike it. I just found it an interesting thing. Let me ask you guys this one other thing real quick. What if the if it had outed Bill Hader? Because that's his fear, right? Is that he's going to be outed. And he ends the movie, it feels like, it, uh, that he still has that fear that people are going to find out that he's gay, right? Yeah, that's what I thought was coming. Yeah. Well, I think if Pennywise would have outed him, it would have felt cheap. If he had outed himself, it would have felt better. Yes, something along those lines where like, you know, this is his worst fear, and he needs to tell everybody in I order like, to not fear it anymore. Right. Well, I feel like there's a lot of things in this movie that are kind of just left unsaid but are understood by the main characters, right? Like, like Bill 
doesn't necessarily need or ask for an explanation of why Beverly just switches gears and goes towards Ben. Right? Like, he gets it. I think he always understood that Ben liked her more, but he was a fat kid, so she wasn't as interested, but now he's hot. So she's all about (laughs) it. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's understood. He doesn't need an explanation. There's a look there, and he understands. I think when they all come out of the house at the end of the movie, Bill Hader is very upset about Eddie still being trapped down there. Way, way more upset than anyone else in that. And they were all equally friends, right? And then there's also that, like, moment when Bill Hader comes out all brave and he's like, truth or dare or whatever. And he's like throwing rocks at him, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I think the losers kind of understood at the end. Like, he wasn't making it a secret at the end of how emotional he was. And it could be wrapped up to like, oh, your friend just died in a horrific way and you spent your final moments with him or you spent his final moments with him. Yeah. But I think the implication there is that there's they un- they know each other very well at this point. They understand a lot of these things about one another. They all understand Beverly's troubled history with her father and with men. You know what I mean? Like they understand Bill's hangups about Georgie. They understand Eddie's fear and and neurosis. They understand at the end of it Richie's um inability to express his emotions in a healthy way. I think these are things that are implied. They're not addressed in the movie very well. I I agree, but I think they are implied. At least I got the impression that at the end of the movie, even if it wasn't outright said, I think everyone kind of understood what what was going on with Richie. That makes sense. I I do think, well, I think the movie's pretty ham-fisted, so if there's nuance in there, I don't want to take it away, but if they had done a little bit more with that, I I would have been a little bit more satisfied. I do like that final moment in the lake with uh, Bill Hader and everybody like, gathering around him and hugging yeah i I thought that was really touching kind of reminded me of roma the that (laughs) scene in roma yeah i had that (laughs) all right i think that's all i've got what do you guys got anything else no i think we've talked about it exhaustively it's better than we make it sound right like i I, it's hard to yeah that's why i wanted to give the star ratings right up front because like there's no way to talk about a movie that is good not great without talking about what's not great about it you know like like I, yeah like i said this earlier but i'll just reiterate before the end i can't think of any scenes that i outright want removed but i could think of a lot of scenes that i would like trimmed yeah all right well i think that does it for this episode then huh i think so <laughs> sure does all right well thank you guys so much for listening and then of course thanks to jake wagner russell for doing our intro and outro music if you want to hear more of his music you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bobscotch All right, stay tuned to this channel. Next week, we will be putting out a casually Criterion episode on Barry Lyndon. Woo! I know. That is the movie that I chose on the most recent poll. (laughs) I want to reiterate that one more time. Thank you, everyone who voted. I couldn't have done it without you. (laughs) So stay tuned to this feed. That's right. So again, if you want to send us questions or topics on Barry Lyndon or any movie review, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Casual Cinecast. You can message us there. You can also email those questions to casualcinemedia at gmail.com. We really appreciate you guys listening. Thanks so much. We will see you next time. So long. Yeah. You'll float too. <laughs> yeah. There's no floating in the second one. That's kind of...